As part of my scouring the internet for things to talk to you about in the makeup news, one of the things I like to do is go and check on brands' Instagram accounts, which sounds really weird, but it's actually not because <laughs> there's a strategy there, there's a reason. And what I like to do is kind of see, you know, brands maybe that I haven't heard from in a while, are they still posting on Instagram? Because I kind of feel like an Instagram account, specifically of a beauty brand, is kind of the heartbeat of the brand. And one of the things I know Noticed this past week is that there's one particular brand that seems to be slowly dying and it's Morphe 2. I'm absolutely fascinated by the companies that are under former brands, and this may be a really bad sign for Morphe 2. I'm gonna tell you everything that I found in just a moment. And then we have quite a few celebrity news stories coming up for you this week. The first one is a beauty brand that is headed by a celebrity. I'm honestly not sure if she owns it or not, but it's her brand. It, it's Her face is all over everything. They've shut down their website. They're no longer selling products, but it's a little confusing as to what is actually happening behind the scenes. Pamela Anderson, who went into the spotlight last year for going to Paris Fashion Week with no makeup, she is now heading a skincare company. And then we have a really goofy story. <laughs> It's goofy. It's Michael Sarah claiming to have started V and have formulated all of the products and V's response to that. I can't wait to share that one with you because it's really fun. And then some disheartening news coming out of the Sephora Reddit page from employees. Sephora is doing really well and they have a really odd way of showing their employees how thankful they are. You're probably going to be frustrated too. Hang tight. We're about to jump into it right now. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to What's Up in Makeup, where we talk about everything that happened across the beauty industry this past week. But before we get into all of the news, we need to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to my bathroom. Today's video is very kindly sponsored by Scentbird. And if you are not familiar with Scentbird, it is a monthly subscription where you choose what fragrances you want to try every single month. Maybe just to try a bunch of fragrances or maybe to figure out your next signature scent. Now, I am not a signature scent kind of person. I like to pop around and try different things, and that's why I've been a Scentbird subscriber for so long, even before they started sponsoring my videos. This month, I wanna share three fragrances with you. But before I do that, I wanna show you the packaging. So this is the relatively new packaging that Scentbird has designed, and basically what this is, is a travel case. So inside here, it's just magnetic, and you open it up here. It's very easy to open, and inside is your fragrance. So the first one we're gonna to talk about is Bohobico's Wet Cherry Liqueur. I just discovered this company through Scentbird. Amazing scents. It's very easy to change out the fragrance and you just go like that. And if you see here, this is open so that you can spray, but all you do in order to make it so that it's locked is just do that. And now it is locked in there and it won't spray in your bag. And one thing that's great is that Scentbird sends these little cards. So on the back, it tells you a little bit about the fragrance and it tells you the notes here. So Bohobico, oh my gosh. This one is cherry, licorice notes, caramel, sandalwood, and tonka bean. And I'm just gonna spray a little bit just to tell you what I smell on my skin. Of course, fragrances can smell different on different people. I smell sweet and spicy. Those cherry notes are really strong. It smells like almost like a cherry martini kind of smell. It smells absolutely amazing. The next one is by Sana Jardin Paris and it is called Vanilla Nomad. I've been really into these like heavy, kind of sweet, spicy fragrances for winter and this one hits the spot. This one is Vanilla Bergamot Captamon sandalwood, and benzoin. I'm just gonna go ahead and spritz it on the other side so I can tell you what I smell. This one's just sexy. It's got like that spicy first, sweet second, vanilla kind of scent. This one's a date night scent, 100%. Or it doesn't have to be a date night. You can just want to smell sexy all by yourself. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. The last one is called Mind Games and it is a scent called Queen. And notes on this are clean cotton accord, apple, orris, saffron, and whipped vanilla bean. And spritz, there we go. This one is definitely more of a sweet scent. It's like a sweet with a little bit of spicy. 
I can see myself really wearing this a lot in March when we have that starting to transition into spring vibe going on. Another thing that's great about Scentbird is that they have such a huge catalog of fragrances and that if we have very different tastes and what we like, there will be something for you over there. It's a huge catalog and some of these fragrances that you try have a value of $150, some of them up to $300 to $500 for a full size. So this is a great way to try it at an extremely low cost, smell a little expensive, and then decide maybe you want to buy a full size. And you can get a vial of Scentbird just like this one for only $17. And you can see how full that is. That is a 30-day supply of fragrance. And because it is in this travel packaging, it's very easy to just throw in a bag. Super, super easy to take it with you on the go if you feel like your fragrance is fading a little bit, just and you're good. So if you are interested in trying Scentbird. I do have a discount code for you. It is going to be in the description box down below. I'm also going to put a QR code over here in case you would like to scan that with your phone. And that discount will make your first vial of Scentbird for your first month only about eight bucks, which is a fantastic deal. So thank you so, so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. I really, really appreciate you. I have loved this service for so many years and that's why I continue to partner with them. It has been a fantastic way for me to try so many different fragrances over the years. And with that being said, my friend, it is now time for What's Up in Makeup. If you've been watching What's Up in Makeup for any length of time, you probably know that I am absolutely fascinated with the Forma brand's bankruptcy. And if that sounds very, oh, yawny to you and bore, it's not. I promise it's not. It has been a very fascinating watch over the past year or so. But one of the major players we focused on is Jaclyn Cosmetics by Jaclyn Hill. They are a Forma brand. They are owned, operated, and run by Forma brands. Forma brands also owns Morphe and Morphe. Morphe too. And they also own one other brand, which we don't talk about as often, and that's Lipstick Queen. As you may have heard, Jaclyn Cosmetics is now officially closed. They do have a We Are Closed sign on their website now. There are still a few products available at the Ulta website on deep discount. So that means that Forma is down to those three brands, Morphe, Morphe 2, and Lipstick Queen. So let's talk about Morphe and Morphe 2 first and talk about how they're doing. Of course, we only know from the outside of what they show us of how they're doing, but Morphe seems to be doing pretty well based on what they're showing us. They are about to launch something soon. Their socials are socialing. <laughs> they're continuing to post, on average, one to two posts a day. Morphe 2 was the brand that they launched with Charlie and Dixie D'Amelio as the faces of the brand. It was supposed to be more of a, a drugstore type brand. It was supposed to be more Gen Z focused. And that brand doesn't seem to be doing as well again, based on what we can see publicly. Here's what I found. So in the months of July of 2023 to December of 2023, Morphe averaged 40 to 41 posts per month. Morphe 2 averaged 17 posts per month, which still seems pretty significant until you look and see the progression of what's been happening over there. So in October, that's when we usually see in the beauty space the big pushes because the holiday season is coming in October is when it all begins. November's when we get hit hard and December it starts to slow down. Well, on the Morphe 2 Instagram page, they posted 17 times in October. They posted only twice in November and twice in December. In January 2024, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Morphe posted 53 times in January. Morphe 2 posted once, just one time, and it was on January 27th. So that is a grand total of five posts in three months. And that is unusual. That is very unusual for a beauty brand. And like I've been alluding to, that may not be indicative of anything, <laughs> really, when it comes down to it. I mean, maybe Morphe 2 just isn't 
putting their budget toward that. Maybe they cut their social media, media marketing team down to like one person and they're putting their money toward product development. Who knows what's really happening over there? But to me, from what I've seen in trends in the beauty space, when an Instagram page starts to slow down, usually that means that the brand is dying a slow death. Now, as for Lipstick Queen, Lipstick Queen was very beloved, specifically for their lipsticks. Their Frog Prince line did so, so well. It was a green lipstick that turned pink. Of course, now we see those color changing lipsticks everywhere, but that wasn't as prevalent in high end cosmetics when Lipstick Queen launched a few of the color changing lipsticks. So people were very fascinated by it. They had a color changing blush and all that. It was very cute. It was, it was cute marketing. It, it just, it definitely got me. I really enjoyed the products. But unfortunately, Lipstick Queen's Instagram account has been completely silent since February of 2020. They were purchased by Forma Brands in October of 2020, and they still haven't posted anything since then. It seems like almost Lipstick Queen was like that sweater you buy, and it looks really cute in the store, but then when you go to wear it, you're like, nah, I'm not sure if I really want to wear that, and then you just don't ever wear it. And <laughs> It's like, that's what it seems like is happening over at Lipstick Queen. They're just not, there's nothing. It's just, it's not happening. But I would love to see Lipstick Queen come back. That's just from personal. Of course, with all of these stories, I'll keep my eye on it. If I see anything new, I always let you know. Singer and actress Becky G started her makeup line Trace Loose Beauty back in 2021. She encouraged customers to, quote, show off brightly boldly and unapologetically. And she put that into the theme. All of the packaging was this bright cobalt blue with a bright yellow, just really just bold and beautiful. But the story of Trace Loose Beauty since December has been really confusing for fans of the brand. It's just like they're kind of hinting at things, but they're not actually saying what's happening and it's confusing. There, there's no chronology. And personally, I'm a very linear thinker. So when things are just mushy gushy, it makes my brain go, ah! And that's what happened on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, Trace Luce posted this on their Instagram. It said, Gracias, Trace Luce family. We created Trace Luce Beauty to honor the unique beauty within you and create a world built on culture, community, and color. We're truly humbled by the immense love and support we've received over the past two years and can't wait for our next chapter. We couldn't have made it this far without you. Con mucho amor, Trace Luce Beauty. But you notice it didn't say the brand was closing and it didn't say it was rebranding and it didn't say that there were more, like it's like mushy it just says a next chapter but what does that mean <laughs> what does it mean it's driving me bonkers and of course the comments next to it lit up with people equally as confused. A user named Never Hitting Pan kind of summed up what I was thinking in their comment next to the post. They said, I'm confused. This sounds like a goodbye post, but back in December, you posted you'd have a new collection and that's why items were super discounted. And they are absolutely right. In December, I'll put up the post for you to read. Trace Lewis's Instagram made an announcement talking a bit about why they created the brand, how they were humbled by the support, and they were, quote, thrilled to announce that we're focusing all our efforts on the brand's new direction. They explained that through January, quote, since these are the last products available for purchase until our next collection, you would be able to purchase the products at 70% off. And like they said, the sale did continue until January 31st. And I was on the website January 31st, and it looked like there were very few items that were sold out, which was surprising to me. As of February 1st, this is what the website looks like now. It's literally just a landing page. There is a place to contact customer service, which I love that they did down at the very, very bottom in really small print. And I looked on their Instagram post to see if people were having any issues with customer service like they were with Jaclyn Cosmetics when they were shutting down. And it looks like there's really just one person on Instagram saying that they haven't gotten their order yet. And I feel like if this is like a, was like a widespread problem, there would be more people posting that maybe it's just something with this one order or maybe a handful of orders, but it doesn't seem to be a widespread problem. As for Becky G, she seems to be absolutely thriving. She was a guest host on Drag Race in January, and the song that she sang for the movie Flame and Hot is currently nominated for an Oscar. The song was called The Fire Inside. Now, if you go over to Becky's Instagram page, her personal Instagram page, there's no mention of Trace Luce 
anywhere, which makes me really, really worried. I mean, hopefully Trace Loose is rebranding and coming back. Hopefully they'll have another collection, but the mushy gushiness of the message of um, we're working on our next chapter and all that, like it's just, it gives me kind of a bad feeling that this is the end for Trace Loose Beauty, but I could be 100% wrong on that. And just a friendly reminder that just because a brand shuts down doesn't mean that it wasn't successful. I mean, Becky seems to be very, very busy. She's got a lot of projects going on, all of these things, and maybe she just doesn't have the time for a project like this anymore, and it had nothing to do with sales. I don't know. But again, as always, I'll keep my eye on it and keep you posted. A pattern you may notice if you spend a lot of time on the internet is there's a lot of focus on negativity and a lot of focus on brands behaving badly and things going wrong. But I do also like to let you know when a brand is doing something with a positive message. And I know that a lot of y'all are not fans of Tarte and I get it, I absolutely get it, but I do wanna highlight this because I think that it is a very interesting move. So this is what's happening. Tarte is going on what they're calling a kindness tour. This tour is in celebration of their 25th anniversary and it is a year-long tour that is featuring what they call activations in 25 different cities around the world. The aim of the tour is to give back to local communities and there is a big focus on giving back to teachers specifically. Tarte is going to offer products as well as donate to teachers and students with school supplies to one local school per city visit. Founder and CEO Maureen Kelly said in a statement, quote, in the world of beauty, it's not just about looking good, it's about feeling good and doing good. Our 25 city kindness tour is a testament to the power of positivity and giving back to the communities that embraced us for a quarter of a century. They started in Los Angeles on January 24th with a pop-up, visiting retailers and hosting creator events. After that, they visited Dallas on the 25th, but what what was strange was there's no like list of cities. You know when you have a tour? <laughs> You know, and you have like a list of cities of where you're going to be. This doesn't exist. Instead, they seem to be asking people where they should go next, which I think is a little bit odd. Like, I love that they want to involve the community, but it feels to me just a little bit disorganized, but I don't know. When I see something that isn't like a, doesn't have a plan laid out, then it makes me think that things will more likely go wrong if they don't have things booked ahead of time. But it's possible they have the list of where they're going already and they're just not putting it out publicly and they're just pretending to get feedback or something. I don't know. I just, if it were me, which it's not, if it were my brand, which is not. I would want to have everything planned. I would want to know what cities we're going to. I wouldn't want to know what schools we're donating to. I want to, I would want to know what venues we're going to before it even starts. <laughs> and then maybe even have a backup if for some reason something goes wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like to start something this big that's like a year long thing with a set number of cities to visit. I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of woo. Like it's, I don't know. It, 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 there may be going on. Like I said, there may be more going on behind the scenes that we just don't know and it is more organized than what they're letting out to us to know. <laughs> if you are curious where the next stop is, Maureen Kelly is going to be updating that on her personal social channels. And as a former teacher, let me just say, I think that giving back to teachers is absolutely fantastic. Teachers are so underappreciated. They work so hard. Unless you have been a teacher, it's hard to know what daily life looks like as a teacher. It is extremely challenging. It is extremely stressful. It is very, very long hours, especially depending on where you work. The hours can be, you know, basically 12, 14 hour days when you count in grading and planning and communicating with parents and all of that. It is a very hard job. So any kind of celebration of teachers, I am 100% for. But what I'm hoping Tart is doing is when they're giving to these schools, that they check with the school and ask them what they need. All too often, we would get donations when I was a teacher, um, especially when I was in a Title I school, which is a lower income school, uh, we would get donations of pencils. And which is great, it's fantastic, but then you have a closet full of pencils and you need something else. And especially with everything moving more digitally, pencils aren't as needed as they once were. So I'm hoping that the team over at Tarte actually reaches out to the school because maybe they need rugs for the classroom for the kids to sit on if it's an elementary school. Maybe they need winter coats for kids that can't afford them. Maybe they need behavioral intervention programs. Maybe they need things for uh, hands-on materials for kids to learn things or things for their 
special education program. There's so many things that a school could need. So I'm hoping that they're actually asking the school how they can support that individual school. I did see that Tarte fulfilled some teacher wish lists this fall, which is fantastic. That is the direction that I am hoping Tarte is going to continue to go with this. And I hope that it goes so well and so smoothly for them. Every week when I'm researching for this show, I Google makeup news. <laughs> Just makeup news. And then I go to the tab that says news and I look and I will tell you there is never a week. There is never a week, never, where there isn't a new celebrity that is shown without makeup. It's like, you know, so-and-so in rare makeup free selfie. Like it's like it, all the time all the time because I feel like we as people are fascinated by the beautiful, the glamorous, what they look like when they wake up in the morning because <laughs> they sure don't look like the way they look when they're on the red carpet. So when Pamela Anderson went to freaking New York Fashion, Paris Fashion Week, not New York Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week with no makeup, people lost their minds because, you know, it's one thing to be going to the grocery store without makeup, but to go to Paris Fashion Week without makeup was un heard of and people really were surprised but also cheering her on and excited for her that she was quote unquote brave enough to go to Paris Fashion Week without makeup. The last time we saw something close to this was when Alicia Keys did a similar thing where she stopped wearing makeup for a period of time. That happened back in 2016 which she now calls a rebellious moment. Anyway, so that brings us to the story that I have for you this week, and it is because Pamela Anderson has now joined the team over at a skincare brand. It is called Sanzi Skin, and she has joined as co-founder and owner. I don't understand how you can be co-founder of something that's already founded. I still don't get that. I didn't understand it with the Susan Yar business. I don't understand it now. Like when a brand already exists, how do you become the founder? Makes no sense to me. But anyway, I digress. So uh, Pamela Anderson is now promoting holistic beauty and self-empowerment through minimalist skincare through this Sanzi Beauty. Beauty is freedom. It's simple. It's your original thoughts. It's not somebody else's thoughts. Being barefaced is being intimate. It's being vulnerable. And it's just a reminder that you are beautiful as you are. Sansi, it goes very much with my philosophy. It's beautiful ingredients, obviously, and it looks good on you. Like you feel like you have that glow naturally and it's just, it just works. You just put it on all day. CEO Roberto A. Philippe explained in a press release, quote, we are thrilled to embark on this journey with Pamela as co-founder. Her authenticity, character, and insight will propel Sanzi forward, fostering global awareness. In the dynamic landscape of the skincare industry, Sanzi unfolds as a narrative of self-acceptance, love, and the pursuit of beyond healthy skin. We can't wait to continue building with our Sanzi family. So the line that already exists pre-Pamela is three products. There's the multi moisture mask it's 48 bucks then we have the super serum for 64 dollars and then the basic balm which is a lip balm for 28 dollars and i was like all right let me look at these ingredients and see what we got going on here so, <laughs> so i looked at it because i'm like is this gonna be one of those preservative free things that ends up going bad really really fast it doesn't look like it it makes me really happy actually these ingredient lists are pretty good so for the balm this was fascinating so the first ingredient in the balm is squalane not the shark stuff the stuff that comes from most of the time from olives, okay? So squalane is the number one ingredient in the balm, which I've looked at a lot of lip balms. I've never seen that as the number one ingredient. Usually it's a little bit further down. The purpose of squalane in a lip product is to prevent trans epidermal water loss, which we definitely need in our lip products. The entire ingredient list seems to have that main big job of preventing that trans epidermal water loss, which is wonderful. It actually looks like a really nice product. So the serum, it has some high hydrating and moisturizing ingredients. There's also some really good antioxidants in there to fight free radical damage. There's also niacinamide really high up. And niacinamide is a great ingredient for a lot of people for different reasons. It doesn't
does a lot of stuff. And they advertise a 4% concentration, which is really important because at a 4% concentration, you also may get some anti-aging skin plumping effects. Beyond that, it can help strengthen the skin's barrier. And what a lot of people use it for is fighting hyperpigmentation. Now the mask seems to have a very specific purpose and that is hydrating the skin. Now moisturizing is what dry skin needs specifically is to put that moisture back into the skin, put that the oils back into the skin. But hydrating is when we put water back into the skin, which all skin types can probably benefit from. Beyond all of the humectants to pull that water into the skin, we also have the squalane, which is going to present that transepidermal water loss and really lock everything in and balance the skin. And what I really want you to take away from this is it really does seem like the ingredients that they're choosing for this line is very science backed, which really makes me very, very happy to see. Because sometimes we see, you know, celebrity skincare lines and it's like, you know, a lot of like experimental, we don't really know, like herbs and flowers and stuff that, you know, theoretically might do something, but you, there's really no evidence behind it. It seems like this skincare line really, you're gonna get your bang for your buck. Could you get something less expensive that might do the same thing? Probably, but this looks like, my point is, is it looks like it's a pretty good skincare line. So congratulations to Pamela. I am very curious to see how this brand does. Celebrity news is sometimes really weird, <laughs> but this is probably one of the weirdest stories that I have seen recently in recent memory. It's very odd. And I think it's because it centers around somebody that is very quirky, Michael Sarah. If he looks familiar, but you're not sure from where, he was in Superbad, he was in Scott Pil Pilgrim versus the World, and most recently he played Alan in Barbie. So th this is what happened. Okay, I tried to find the full chronology of the whole thing. This is the first thing that I found. So there is a model, her name is Haley Khalil, okay? So she posts on her Instagram this video. You guys have been asking for a skincare routine, so come with me to do a restock. It's so cold. We made it. Okay, I think it was. Is that Michael Sarah? Wait, I think that's Michael Sarah. I'm gonna try to get closer. I'm gonna try to get closer. Are those stickers? Wait, what is he doing? Some lovely cream uh, here. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, thank you. Wait. He signed them. That was weird. That is funny. Like that literally made me laugh out loud. Just absolutely adorable. So what happens next is three days later, Michael goes on a podcast and the podcast is with a person named Bobby Athoff and the podcast is called The Really Good Podcast. And he said this. What are you, what, what are you talking about exactly? Just so I just swear. Sarah, they, Sarah. Well, that's funny. I mean, that's my name is Sarah, so. Yeah, and you claim you, you started that. No, I just say, you know, I don't claim that, but I just... What if you, you look at my name, my name is Michael Sarah. So, and then you know, people kind of tend to draw the no uh, one draws obvious. That, well, no one draws that claim. No and, one and neither do I. But um, yes. I just say, look at the name. That's all I say. And then other posts started popping up. So for example, a TikToker named Darcy McQueenie fan got a box with a tape that had Michael Sarah's picture on it. And inside was all the Sarah V products. And there were quite a few more posts, but I'm just gonna skip ahead because they're all, you know, they all have their unique twist, but it's basically the same thing over and over. Michael Sarah claiming sort of that he's the one that formulated Sarah V. Then on January 30th, Sarah V responded. So they put this statement on their TikTok, on their Instagram. The caption says, setting the record straight. In the post, they say that Sarah V is developed by dermatologists and they deny claims of Michael's involvement with the brand. But then the madness got even bigger. Like they just keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a TikToker, his name is Caleb W. Simpson, who got a secret tour of Michael's trailer on some upcoming project and he opened opens the door and there's just CeraVe products everywhere. There's a little microscope and it just, the whole trailer is full of CeraVe products. 
On Caleb's post, Sarah V specifically responded. They said, the man's obsessed. But if you look carefully, one thing you might notice on all of the posts is that Sarah V is trying to make this joke go off without violating FTC regulations. Every single post says hashtag Sarah V partner. So of course, this is clearly an attempt for Sarah V to have a viral marketing campaign with Michael Sarah as the star. There is even a website now. It is www.imsarahv.com. It is goofy. It is silly. I was really with them, but I feel like, you know, for me personally, the more of the content that I watched, the more I kind of got tired of it. But if I had only seen like one or two of the clips and hadn't researched it and they just came across my feed, I think I would have, I would be a little bit more like not tired of it. You know what I'm saying? But I think because I sought it out and I've found so many any posts on it, it's like, are we going to keep going with this? <laughs> But I think for the average person, it's not going to feel like that. But what I would like to know is what you think of this type of ad campaign. Do you think that it's goofy and silly and fun and great? Or do you think it's annoying? I would love to know your thoughts. Speaking of skincare, but in the real world of real dermatology, not the advertising world, the American Academy of Dermatology has updated their guidelines for acne management. Here's what you need to know if you or someone that you love is trying to manage their acne. So first, you're supposed to talk to, of course, your personal doctor because they are the only ones that are going to know which acne treatment is best for the kind of acne that you are getting. There are 18 evidence-based recommendations that include topical, systemic, and physical treatments. The recommendations are for people ages nine and up that have acne that is bothering them. The last update on these recommendations was 2016, so it's about time. Topical treatments that they recommend are benzoyl peroxide, retinoids, or a combination, and they say a combination may lead to better results. They also say that oral antibiotics can help, but they should be limited to reduce the development of antibiotic resistance or other associated complications. If there are larger bumps, they say that they can be injected with corticosteroids for more rapid relief of inflammation and pain. Conditional recommendations are things like topical class goterone, I don't know how to say that one, I'm sorry, salicylic acid and azelaic acid, as well as oral administration of minocycline or or seracycline, as well as hormone therapies, including oral contraceptives. That's one that I've heard since I was very young. And then spironolactone. Now, this really surprised me. They found insufficient evidence to prove that chemical peels, laser devices, light devices, microneedling, dietary changes, vitamins, or plant-based products help treat acne. I was absolutely surprised, especially the light therapy, because that's becoming very, very popular, all of those light masks. The blue color specifically is supposed to help with acne. They said that it is insufficient evidence. So that doesn't mean that these things don't work. They just haven't found enough evidence yet to say that they do work. A lot of these things I feel like we kind of already knew as a society, especially people that are trying to manage their acne, but it's always good when dermatologists update to the public what works so that people know that they should continue doing whatever it is they're already doing, or if something isn't working, there are other options for you. All right, are you ready for legal stories? That's never going to get old. Okay, so one thing I've noticed since I have been researching class action lawsuits is there seem to be trends in class action lawsuits. There will be one class action lawsuit that fights against something, and then a bunch of other ones will pop up. And if one of those wins, then you'll see even more pop up. But if they don't, win is not the right word. When it is found in favor of the plaintiff, of the people that are that are filed the class action lawsuit, then more of them seem to pop up. If it doesn't fall in favor of the plaintiff, then they tend to disappear. So there is a new one that is starting to pop up. And it's because brands have decided that advertising as preservative free is a good thing, that it will bring in the clean beauty enthusiasts who want preservative free products. Like, what are we doing? What what are we doing here? We are not buying an apple. <laughs> We are, we are buying cosmetic products and even apples, they'll put preservatives on them. If they have them, like the ones that are in the bag, they're sliced, they'll put preserve. 
Really? Really? So anyway, there's two lawsuits that just popped up against two different brands, two different parent companies. We have Neutrogena and Aquaphor. The products in question are the Neutrogena T-Cell Therapeutic Shampoo and the Aquaphor Lip Repair. The suits claim that both products contain preservatives that have multiple functions, including preserving the product. So like, for example, the shampoo has citric acid in it which is the same as they're gonna put on the, the apple so that in the bag it doesn't turn brown, right? Citric acid, they're saying, is a preservative. So you can't say it's preservative-free because it has citric acid in it. And then the lip balm, it's an ingredient called sodium ascorbyl phosphate. This is a quote directly from the Neutrogena lawsuit. They say, the global sale of clean beauty products is forecasted to reach 22 billion by 2024. Thus, consumers are willing to pay a premium for healthy, preservative-free skincare and cosmetic products as they hoped for in purchasing the Neutrogena shampoo. In the Aquaphor suit, it specifically says the plaintiff, a New York City resident who has purchased the Aquaphor product numerous times, claims she would not have paid as much for the item or bought it at all had she known its preservative-free representation was false. Where are we? Why are we, why are we doing this? how did we get here to that we want mold instead of preservatives we want bacteria instead of preserve my friends what the fuck? <laughs> like, like oh my gosh like how how but honestly i will say this though it is the brand's fault too it is the brand's fault for using this particular claim and promoting this claim as something that is marketable. It is their fault too. They should not be putting preservative free on their products if they had any kind of responsibility to the consumer. Can you tell I'm getting heated? It shouldn't be on there anyway. But at the same time, I am so saddened by the fact that people think that preservatives are bad. When, because when is this gonna stop? When are we going to stop this madness? When are we going to stop escalating the clean beauty movement that is not regulated and fear-mongering in order to scare people, because that's what it is. It's in order to scare people into buying your product. And fear is a huge motivator. And honestly, I see this ending only when someone who's using preservative-free products, natural products, gets very, very sick. Because the, the companies do not care about the person. All they care about is making the money. And it seems like they care more about the marketing of a clean beauty product than the actual safety of the consumer. And it makes me just flames on the side of my head. Just flames. If that last story didn't leave you irritated with brands, this one probably will. <laughs> so, you know, when a brand does well, right? Ideally, ideally. The brand passes on the profits or the, the, the success onto the employees that help them to get there. And we all know that Sephora is doing very, very well. I mean, they, they're crushing it. They just recently hit a $10 billion sales mark. $10 billion. And that's just North America. That doesn't count the stores that they've just opened up outside of North America. So $10 billion in revenue. You would think that these employees that are trying to hit these sales goals and things like that, that they would give them maybe a little bonus or something. Maybe, oh no, they gave them a cookie. I'm not kidding. They gave them a cookie. And they didn't even go to all stores just some stores. Uh, cookies had an attached thank you note that said, inside this box, you will find a sweet treat to enjoy with your team. We thank you for making it our greatest year ever. Cheers. And then, this is the kicker, it was followed by a statement that was kind of a warning. It said, the content of this card is confidential and should not be shared externally as it is a violation of our company policies. And apparently, they weren't even delicious cookies. People were saying that they were stale. Oh my gosh. And in the age of the internet and in the age of Reddit, you can't just say to employees, hey, don't talk about this, especially when it's many, 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 many that are involved and you can't pinpoint exactly who it is because Reddit is anonymous. And of course, the employees started taking to Reddit and being like, what the f <laughs> Like, one anonymous poster wrote, they are always coaching us to meet our goals and expectations. And of course, everyone goes above and beyond for the company and all they give us is a stale cookie and a letter thanking us. Another employee told Business Insider, quote, when we got the cookies, we were like, wait, what? 
It's obvious they're not listening to us, the employee said. These are people who don't know how this actually works and how important we are to the operation. So Business Insider did reach out to Sephora and ask for a statement, and they did have a very, not surprisingly, corporate response. This is what they said. They said that they, quote, had a great year thanks to our extraordinary team members, so they know, who helped create and build our incredible beauty community. We're proud of all of our employees across our stores, distribution centers, and corporate offices who contributed to this shared success in North America. As the leading prestige beauty retailer, it's success like this that allows us to continue to offer highly competitive benefits and pay, performance bonuses, education, brand perks, training product, gratis, and substantial product discounts to our employees. After they got that statement, Business Insider did say that it was unclear whether Sephora actually gave any kind of bonuses or anything besides the cookies. So we don't know. But in the end, if you know your employees I mean, you think about the people that are in the warehouses packing the stuff, the managers in the warehouses that are making sure that people are packing the stuff. I mean, they're the ones that make Sephora shipping faster. They're the ones that make sure nothing gets broken. The people on the sales floor, they're the ones recommending products. They're the ones putting makeup on the people that come in and show them how good it looks on their skin. Like you would think that there would be something besides a cookie. For ten billion b -b 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 billion dollars? Come on, Sephora. That's not okay. And that, my friend, was what's up in makeup this week. Thank you so, so much for watching. Product report coming tomorrow on Mondays is when we're doing the product report now. And speaking of that, thank you so much to the What's Up in Makeup Facebook hunters. Their names are scrolling below me. Thank you so much for all your submissions this week. I appreciate you. This last story of Sephora and the cookie came from the hunters group. So thank you to everybody who contributes over there. It really does help me out so much and helps me to have a complete show. So I appreciate you. We are are having our live chat today at 10 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to be hanging out, talking about makeup. Hopefully you can join us. If you can't, it's no problem at all. It's very easy to catch on the replay. If you're subscribed, super easy. Just go to your subscription feed. It should be there. And just a reminder, if you're not subscribed, there's no guarantee that YouTube is going to notify you or put on your homepage what's up in makeup in the future. So the best way to make sure you don't miss a show is to subscribe to make sure that you don't miss anything. If you are not subscribed though, you can and look down below and check out the What's Up and Makeup live chat podcast, or you can go to my channel page, click on the live tab, and they're all housed there. Thank you so, so much for watching What's Up and Makeup. It really means so, so much to me. I'm really glad that you've been enjoying the two show format. At least most of you, almost everybody's been enjoying it. So thank you so much for the feedback on that. If you would like to hang out a little longer and watch something else, especially if you missed last week's show, YouTube should be recommending a couple videos for you over here to watch. Last week's show is going to be right there, or two weeks ago show is going to be right there. YouTube's going to pick the top one based on your viewing history. But if you do got to go, I get it. Got a lot going on. Thank you for hanging out as long as you did. And mad love to you. And I will see you in a video very, very soon.